Izzy goes to sleep after Yom Kippur one fateful year, and Izzy has a dream. And in his dream, God says to him, Izzy, yours is a modest and good life. Be proud of who you are and how you live. In this new year, I want you to have one new thing. What would you like? All right, now remember, this is a story. Do not approach God as if a genie who grants wishes. And do not imagine, because I know how the story ends, that God hurts you either. That's neither what Judaism believes nor how the world works. Remember those of you last night? Faith is not fact. I just want to be clear on this point before I continue the story. So in his dream, Izzy hears himself answer God. You know what I would like, God? I would like to buy something expensive that I can't normally afford, especially before the cold of winter. Morning comes, Izzy awakes from his dream, and it seems like it was just that, a dream. God doesn't answer such requests. And just as Izzy is about to go about his day, an Amazon delivery truck pulls up to his house and drops off a large box. And he opens the box, and he finds inside a cashmere overcoat, a hat, and designer sunglasses, things he could never previously afford. Wow, he exclaims. Anxious to show off his new apparel, Izzy puts on his coat, puts on the hat, puts on the glasses, and heads for the door. He walks out of his house and starts to cross the street. And suddenly, as it was turning around, that same Amazon truck speeds up and knocks Izzy down. And there he is, bruised, lying in the street. And Izzy calls out to God. How could you let this happen? Didn't you just send me this new coat, this new hat, these new sunglasses? And Izzy hears a voice from on high, a sound just like the voice he heard in his dream. Izzy, that was you? I didn't recognize you. <laughs> it's just a story. But I tell it because we get that. A change in someone's familiar appearance surprises us. Sometimes we don't recognize people we associate with one place when we meet them in another. More than once I have received a quizzical glance in the grocery store or out and about. Like I'm only supposed to be here. <laughs> Occasionally, we pass judgment quietly, or we express curious surprise. What are they doing here? Or worse, what are they doing here? Honestly, most of us recognize very little about the people we're here with today. Outside of family and genuine friends, in this space, we are a community of acquaintances, familiar faces, volunteers who work on various pursuits, new participants, welcome visitors, and folks we haven't had the chance to meet yet. I really enjoy, from this vantage point, seeing you, seeing everyone outside, the coming and the going. It's really a wonderful sense of community, but I'm sensitive to the fact that we just don't know each other. In personal reality, we are each about much more than whatever small aspects of our personalities, our interests, our capacities, our appearances, and our life routines that we display here. And outside of observing Yom Kippur together, which is our bond this sacred day, another time we need to find the opportunities to grow closer and better known to one another. The same is true about our relationships with Judaism and our precious Jewish heritage. On Yom Kippur, Judaism appears to be about atonement, forgiveness, spiritual, personal, and moral growth. The machzor, 
as we read through its words, presents us images of a judging, a loving, a forgiving, and a compassionate God. You're familiar with the words. Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum Vechahanun. Eternal God, eternal God, merciful and compassionate, patient, abounding in love and faithfulness, assuring love for thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, and granting pardon. Taken out of context, these Torah words we recite comfort us today and religiously, spiritually assure us. They symbolize the divine promise of kindness and forgiveness on this day of atonement and introspection. Let me, however, remind you, it is always, always dangerous to take words, people, or memories out of context. When the Torah portrays God describing these divine attributes to Moses, here's how the full text reads. Moses carved two tablets of stone like the first, and early in the morning he went up to the top of Mount Sinai. And the eternal God passed before him and proclaimed, Eternal God, eternal God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, assuring love for thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, and pardoning and granting pardon. Yet God does not remit all punishment, but visits the iniquity of parents upon children and children's children upon the third and fourth generation. Oof, that's more difficult. That's a challenging image from ancient days. That's an image the rabbis do not want us to read in the Mosor today. So they pulled the words they wanted out of its original context. And we recognize the promise of love and forgiveness. We're put off by the rest of the phrase, words of retribution that are in the original Torah text. It's not only us. The prophet Ezekiel was too. He declares a different belief, the one that the Talmudic rabbis used to explain their theological editing. Ezekiel says, As I live, declares the eternal God, this proverb shall no longer be current among Israel. The person who sins, only he or she is responsible. Much better. But it leads me to explain something. Judaism is a full, varied, and multifaceted religious history and tradition, an inheritance we each receive while appreciating, understanding, or even believing only some or much of a larger, dynamic whole. Each of us interpreting, determining, and exploring. All of us welcome to be part of the evolving, enduring, and ever-fascinating Jewish conversation that gives context, content, and consequence to our lives. Some of us here today entered with an instinct for and an understanding about what we're here to do. Others of us entered today sincerely to participate and to be present, but with less comfort in or feel for the larger context of Jewish ritual and religious tradition. It's only natural. We each live in the circumstances and influences of our lives. Our personal contexts evolve or broaden slowly, over time, as we discover more, respond to situations, fulfill curiosities and interests, decide to leave things, even people, behind, or act on a personal desire to change. Like a child leaving home, off to college or elsewhere, poised, excited, yet nervous about their newfound independence, opportunities, and responsibilities, like all of us grieving the loss of a cherished love and precious personality in our lives who somehow over time find resilience in our memories and the renewal of our days. 
or like a couple who start to build their life together, like an individual who decides to make a change in his or her position or location, like someone who breaks a bad habit, makes a healthier choice, or honestly improves on a personal weakness, like anyone who starts out again, starts over again, or strives to alter aspects of his or her life again, like the person who picks up a new hobby, masters a new skill, learns a new subject, or thinks about our new idea, like all of us who at one time or another have to react to a thrilling prospect or a devastating incident, like receiving an unwanted diagnosis or being relieved by the desired outcome, like all that fills our days with purpose, activity, relationships, and yearnings. We live our lives in the contexts of who we are, of what we know, of all that we may choose, and in response to what we cannot control. Which is why living out of context is not natural. And being honest about the context in which we live is so vital. When we understand ourselves, when we understand our environments, we see even more promise and possibility for being and becoming who we truly are. This is about living out to be our authentic selves. This is our personal quest and goal on Yom Kippur to grow toward the fullest dignity of our real and authentic place and purpose in life. Utkablenu bitshuva shlema, we recite. Accept us fully when we turn. And this is also our people's quest and our Jewish people's goal in the world, to exist in the fullest dignity of our real and authentic place and purpose. Bestow honor among your people, we ask of God many times today. Like Abraham, heeding God's command to journey from everything familiar to a new unknown land and life. Like Moses leading the children of Israel out from the painful realities of their enslavement toward a new vision of freedom in that new land promised to them, Abraham's descendants. It's all about context. Though there is a universal reality to the experience of being human, meaning and significance come from our particular identities and experiences. If we are not each unique, if we are not each unique, the world has no need for our personal gifts and talents. Out of context, we are inauthentic. We have no wisdom or vision to share with the larger world. We have less with which to build relationships with a variety of people. If we are not distinctive as a group, we don't have a story to tell about our particular historical context, which is why it can be difficult to be a Zionist in an environment where so many others do not understand the context of Zionism. They don't understand the context of Israel. And they certainly do not understand our context, the Jewish religious and historical experience. Yet in this joyous 75th year of Israel's independence, we must understand that past in order to represent Zionism effectively and celebrate proudly what Israel is today. Zionism, though always a religious tenant of Judaism, became a political and cultural expression of Jewish identity when the 19th century emancipation of Western European Jews brought them social acculturation and intellectual exploration along with spreading assimilation and anti-Semitic humiliation. As Theodore Herzl wrote in 1896, 
we have honestly endeavored everywhere to merge ourselves into the social life of surrounding communities and to preserve the faith of our fathers. We are not permitted to do so. In countries where we have lived for centuries, we are still denounced as strangers. Next year in Jerusalem is our old phrase. It is now a question of showing that the dream can be converted into a living reality. And thus, political Zionism was born. Today, Israel is much more than a living reality. It is a reality in which and around which we, the Jewish people, live. The Jewish state of Israel is our place of fulfillment and destiny, not only an address of care or concern. And too often, too many American Jews condition their feelings for Israel. They wrongly think that the way to disagree is to disavow. No. The mutually responsible way to disagree, if you must, is first to care and then to engage, just like they do in Israel, just like we do here as American citizens who debate the dilemmas of our American nation. We disagree, we don't disavow, but we have to remember and remind others, America's and Israel's social and demographic contexts are completely different. Fifty years ago, can't believe I'm saying that, fifty years ago as a teenager, I learned that to be a Zionist is to be an idealist and a realist. It is to be thoughtful, educated, and aware of where Israel achieves, where Israel may fall short, and most of all, why Israel matters. And I learned this 50 years ago as a teenager from David Ben-Gurion, Israel's founding prime minister, whom I had the privilege to meet in his Tel Aviv home. 16 years old, he looked at me taught what he wanted to teach, urged me to finish high school and come back to Israel to live. I promised I would consider it. What else could I say? Which, of course, in honesty, I did through the years. Here's what Ben-Gurion taught. Israel is more than a country, more than our people's historic homeland. Israel's independence requires no one's permission. We who are the people of Israel have given our vision and experience to all of humanity, and in return we have earned our secure and historic place within the community of nations. A place we have made because it has never been given. A place we secure because no one else will. Our children, our grandchildren, especially our college students, need our support in understanding Ben-Gurion's message. The more contemporary context of their lives cannot know what we witnessed, what we know to be true, what history itself confirms. In so many ways, it is on us to teach and inspire the next generation from our different life contexts. As you are all well aware, many college campuses today are rife with anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic campaigns and hate-filled rhetoric and images that demonize and delegitimize Israel. And what you may not understand is many of these campaigns are coordinated internationally by Israel's avowed enemies. Is it not morally ironic and completely hypocritical that those who denigrate Israel about human rights, 
themselves discriminate against Jews, Israel, and our rights. Such bias misunderstands the complicated political issues of nationality and sovereignty in the Middle East. We all genuinely grieve the loss, pain, and human suffering. We feel it for each IDF soldier and Israeli citizen when they are killed or wounded or for his or her family. We feel it for all innocent Palestinian families who mourn their losses of children and loved ones. We feel it throughout the region. Through the lens of our people's story and moral memory, however, we see cause and effect. We see goodness and hatred. We see narratives and context for an intractable conflict. Apparently, many others don't. Our Jewish college students who understand this, who themselves are sensitive to, in, who themselves are sensitive to injustice in our society and throughout the world, currently find it challenging to contextualize and vocalize their support for Israel. Living our Jewish identities on or off campus requires knowledge, passion, and confidence. It should not require our students or our own courage in this land at this time. And that's why you and I work to create the context for a vibrant living Judaism here where we live. To be a Zionist today also means to be an advocate for a community of engaged and educated Jews. Taken as a whole, our synagogue community is a microcosm of the entire Jewish people. We come from all walks and all nations. We come from all contexts of historical memory and experience. Our synagogue campus is our Israel, our spiritual center, our address. In this context, we share in the fullness of Jewish authenticity and the evolving, enduring, and ever-fascinating Jewish conversation that sets out a vision for our world and imparts significance to our lives. Let me bring these remarks back to you. In the unique context and personal places of your life, what is your private conversation about the authentic you? What promise and possibility for being and becoming who you truly are is on your mind this sacred day? Izzy may have changed his appearance, but when he did, did he change himself? Ezekiel and the rabbis may have changed the way we perceive God's attributes, but when they did, did they change the mystery of God's nature? We may, and at times should, change aspects of our lives' contexts. But when we do so, are we sustaining or discovering our authentic selves? At all times, and in every context, as individuals, as Zionists, and as Jews, we are unique, striving to grow striving to refine, striving to improve to be sure, but always content and confident in being who we are. In this new year, may God recognize and accept you for who you are. May all who know you recognize and accept you for who you are. And may you, too, recognize and accept who you are, realizing in the context of every day, meaning, purpose, and the blessings of life. Yimar Chatima Tovah.